Good morning. Welcome. It is Eric Erickson here. How are you? I hope you had a good weekend. The phone number here, 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. If you want to be a part of the program, you can follow me on the social media outlets at EW Erickson, and you can email me, eric at the resurgent.com. Uh, Florida case count surpasses that of New York, the country's original epicenter. According to NPR, can, can we be very careful? This is such a a bad headline and a bad story. And we're going to see more and more of this as the media fixates on swing states. Have you noticed the coverage of Arizona, uh, how critical the coverage is? Arizona is in crisis. And yet the data out of Arizona suggests that the uh, the state of Arizona has moved beyond the virus. Things have trended in the right direction in Arizona. The number of cases are declining. Uh, the, the state, including here in Georgia, the, the situation in Georgia is improved. The situation in Arizona is improved. The situation in Florida is improving. And yet we are told repeatedly that uh, the United States, it is the swing states of, of Arizona, Georgia, and Florida, all with Republican governors that are, for some reason, uh, doing just absolutely terribly. Um... You know, I'm pulling up the data now from the, yeah, Georgia looks like it has plateaued. Tennessee has plateaued. Nevada is in steep decline all of a sudden, uh, trending in the right direction. And it just looks to be like things are settling down out there, including in Looking at Florida, yep, Florida looks like it's doing well. Florida has, is trending now down. South Carolina down, Texas down, Idaho down. Uh, things headed in the right direction. Now, suddenly deaths are increasing in Arizona and Florida. That We know that's a lagging indication. That, that is where uh, everyone has, has noted. And in Georgia, uh, cases are down 4% week over week. Even as testing expands, the positive rates are going down. This is all good news. Now, why, why do I bring all of this up? Because we need to get to this NPR story. Uh, headline, Florida case count surpasses that of New York, the country's original epicenter. Florida has recorded more coronavirus cases than New York. Only California, the most populous state in the country, has more. As of Sunday afternoon, data from Johns Hopkins University shows 423,855 people in Florida have tested positive compared to 411,736 in New York. California leads with 450,242 cases. New York managed to bring the number of deaths and hospitalizations under control in late spring as cases began to surge in many western and southern states. Now, here is something that is left out of the NPR report that puts context into this, appropriate context into what is going on. Florida is testing on average 50 to 60,000 people a day. Two Saturdays ago, Florida did 150,000 tests in a single day. New York never got over 20,000 to 30,000 tests a day. So Florida doing more tests than New York is showing more cases than New York showed. And yet Florida only just now has topped New York. Now, maybe, just maybe, but bear with me for a minute. If we're supposed to be on the side of science, because everybody these days says they want to be on the side of science. If we're to be on the side of science when it comes to analyzing what's going on with the virus, should it scientifically matter in a headline that suggests that Florida has now surpassed New York in the total number of coronavirus cases? Should it matter that New York never did the amount of testing that Florida is doing? Because we know you test more people, you find more cases. New York's testing was around twenty to 30,000 cases a day. Florida's has been around fifty to 60,000 cases a day or tests a day. And Florida, guess what? Only now, at the end of July, has surpassed New York, which never did the number of tests. And we know from study after study and, and, and news report after news report that the number of people who died in New York in the last three months exceeds dramatically the number of people who died in New York last year in the same three months. There had to be something going on there. 
which suggests if we actually are scientifically committed to believe in science and worship at the throne of an altar of science, that maybe it's not that Florida has exceeded New York. It's just we know Florida's count better than New York's. I mean, that is the logical presumption here, that New York actually had way more cases still. New York had hundreds of thousands more cases than we'll ever know. And and tens of thousands of people died in New York more than we knew of the virus. But it is interesting to see the fixation of the media on places like Georgia and Florida and Arizona and Texas. All three of those states, Republican governors, all four of those states, Republican governors, all four of those states suggested that 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 perhaps Joe Biden might have a have a run at them. And the media has obsessed with them. The media has fixated on them. The media only wants to focus on those states that Joe Biden might be able to win. The media has largely ignored California. Even let me give you this this running, just 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 the the opening paragraph of this NPR story again. Florida has recorded more coronavirus cases than New York. Only California, the most populous state in the country, has more. And then California fades from the story. And it's all about Florida and New York and how Andrew Cuomo gradually lifted New York's stay-at-home order on a regional basis. In most of Florida, businesses such as restaurants and retail stores could open starting in May. The governor resisted calls to impose a statewide mask mandate. By the way, uh, you should know in uh, Nevada, in Arizona, in uh, Florida, in Texas, in Georgia now, the, the overwhelming majority of residents are wearing masks in public, and the case rate is declining in these states. In some states, there's a mandatory mask order, like in Alabama, there's a mandatory mask order. The cases are starting to go down. Uh, and, and again, there's there's like a two-week, three-week lag. But there does appear to be in states that imposed a mask mandate and began to enforce it. Remember, California had a mask mandate, and they never enforced it. Alabama just imposed a mask mandate with its governor a few weeks ago and enforced it. And uh, you, you wait two weeks with coronavirus to see the trend lines because it can take two weeks. And things are starting to go down. In Georgia, Governor Kemp began a statewide, he didn't mandate it, but he began a statewide campaign to get people to wear masks. And it's worked. Uh, Surveys show that over 70% of Georgians are now wearing masks. And this virus has plateaued. Same in Florida. The governor in Florida never imposed a mandate, but urged people in public to wear masks. And now they're in decline. Arizona Perhaps one of the biggest success stories, in 14 days, there's been a very rapid decline in Arizona. The common and prevailing trend, though, is an obsession with swing states in the media. They build up Andrew Cuomo as some sort of hero, despite all the people in New York dying. They ignore the fact that other states have exceeded the testing capacity of New York and are discovering more cases. They ignore anything that could actually show what happened accurately to paint Republican governors in the worst possible light. Is it any wonder that people are checking out on on these news stories and and people are going about their business? Is it any wonder? Now, here's the thing. Uh, We still got a ways to go. There are some scientists starting to, to, to see some correlation. Again, I mentioned this the other day. Um, there are some scientists out there now openly speculating that when about 20% of a population gets the infection, it starts to recede, that most of the people who get the infection never know it uh, or they have very mild cases, and that it has spread enough within 20% of the population that it starts to burn itself out. There are some scientists, including uh, Michael Levitt uh, at Stanford University. He's a biophysicist who was saying he expects that by August we will see the virus in full retreat, that it won't be gone away completely, but will have mostly burned itself out. 
Uh, now, he is uh, on the outside edge. Most of the people in medicine, uh, they're paying attention to what he's saying. They don't necessarily agree with him. But it is remarkable. He was one of the first people to call people's attention to this 20% number. And that does appear to be bearing out that when 20% of a, uh, an, a population gets it, it begins to decline. Now, whether that is because the virus burns itself out or because other people in the community start responding aggressively, uh, we, 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 we're not, I, I don't know that we're going to know that. But let's just put it to you this way. Uh, the media is about to start focusing on deaths again. How do I know that we're about to hear an extended, prolonged conversation about the number of people who have died of the virus? Because when you look at the swing states the media has obsessed about, whether it is Florida or Georgia or Arizona or Texas, that's not really a swing state, but the media is convinced it is, the virus is again on decline. Things are trending in the right direction. But deaths are a lagging indicator. And so deaths have been going up per capita in those states, in Florida, in Georgia, in Texas, in Arizona. And the media is not going to be able to focus on how the virus is running rampant if it's in decline. So instead, what they will need to do is focus on the deaths. The bad news is, let's say that Levitt is right. Let's say that this Dr. Michael Levitt is right. Uh, If the virus is in full decline by August, that really does give the president a foothold. You know, the the president has entered this tone, which is actually somewhat impressive for a president who doesn't manage to consistently stick to stuff. He, He has decided he's given up on throwing out the pitch at the Yankees. He says he's fixated on focusing on the virus. He's canceled activities. He's canceled the convention. He wants to focus on the virus. People are starting to realize, hey, maybe, maybe the president realizes there's something up. And it appears to be working in the president's favor. His polling slide has stopped. Vice President Biden is starting to freak out about uh, Fox News wanting to give him an interview in the same way they gave uh, Donald Trump an interview. And the media is trying to come up with all sorts of creative ways to now say Republican governors handled this more incompetently than Andrew Cuomo. And the latest is they've got to ignore the amount of testing data that's been done out there in states like Florida, which actually shows, by the way, the competence of the Florida administration to be able to get that much testing done out there. They got to come up with exciting new ways to condemn Republicans out there and make this about their failures so that they can uh, build a case for the Democrats. And the polling out there looks like it has worked to the Democrats' advantage. Uh, in North Carolina, Joe Biden is ahead. Uh, what's his name? The uh, Tom Tillis, the senator from North Carolina, is behind his Democratic opponent. Uh, in Montana, it looks like the Democrats could pick up the Montana seat. If all this played out, the Democrats would pick up the Senate. But here's the problem. If the virus does fade, we're headed into August. If the virus does begin to fade and the economy does begin to rebuild, Who do voters say they trust with the economy? It is not Joe Biden. So we're going to have a lot of people have to fan the flames if this thing does. Right now, it's still a serious situation. Everybody needs to take precautions. Stay home if you can. Wash your hands a lot. Uh, Use hand sanitizer if you can. Wear a mask in public. It will get our economy going. It will get the virus out of here. We're starting to see this. Remember, it's a lagging indicator. Everything with coronavirus, you got to wait about two weeks to see what's happening in those states where they've been enforcing the mask mandate, unlike California, which imposed it but didn't enforce it. They're seeing the trend lines for the virus go down. People are staying home again. People are washing hands. It's the young people who are getting the virus. Uh, the, the, the death counts for the elderly are starting to go down. We're headed in the right direction with this virus. That opens the playing field for the president at a moment where he needs to have the playing field open. As the polling seems to stabilize for him, he's still down. But the voters consistently want him in charge of an economic rebound. If he can get that rebound started before the election, he wins the election. I want you guys to remember a name, uh, Burnell Trammell. Remember Burnell Trammell's name. This This is important. Uh, and welcome back. It is Eric Erickson, if you're just tuning in. Uh, Ber- Burnell Trammell was a supporter of Black Lives Matters in Wisconsin. 
uh, took to the streets in support of the cause that black lives do matter. He also was a Donald Trump supporter, vocally supported Donald Trump. In fact, he uh, had a business express journal publications. He was seen holding up vote Donald Trump signs. He would engage members of the black community around them, uh, trying to persuade them to support Donald Trump, trying to explain how their lot in life had improved because of Donald Trump. He supported free speech aggressively. Someone over the weekend uh, pulled up to his business and gunned him down. He was in front of his business. The person rode up, shot him, drove away. They have no suspects. Remember Burnell Trammell's name. You know, the it, I've I watched the HBO series Westworld. I, I don't recommend it to you. It, for most of you, it probably wouldn't be your cup of tea. But uh, one of the characters says these violent delights have violent ends. The, the situation we're seeing in the streets of Portland – uh, Oregon and elsewhere, these violent delights will have violent ends. I don't even know why they're rioting now. Uh, we're 57 days removed from the George Floyd situation. You know, the NAACP in Portland, Oregon has come out and said that, uh, it, that these these protests and riots have no meaning, no purpose at this point, that they have completely been taken over by young white people who have no connection to or solidarity with the black community, and that they see no point in having them. And they are encouraging black residents to avoid them, uh, but it, it's a bunch of young white people. I saw a video of a, um, of, of, there was a, so there was a protest in Las Vegas this weekend. And apparently there were young people, young white kids wearing black, walking down streets, holding motorcycle helmets so that they could go to the protest. That doesn't sound like you're having a peaceful protest when you're dressed in black military garb and carrying, uh, motorcycle helmets to head to a peaceful protest as a protester. Sounds like you're going to stir up trouble or you're expecting trouble to be there. Uh, there was a lot of trouble in a number of places, including in Minneapolis. A, uh, a An affordable housing project was burned by rioters. You, you know, in Portland, Oregon, a local radio show host, a progressive radio show host, was telling people how uh, the, vi- the, the riots are being mischaracterized. He said that the president and his team, they're distorting the, the protest. They're making it out to be violent. It's not really violent. And then those peaceful protesters burned his apartment complex down. I don't know that they knew he lived there, but irony knows no bounds. We got got issues here, uh, and the president now wants to send uh, more federal forces out to Chicago. Here's the mayor of Chicago responding to this. Well, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. No troops, no agents that are coming in outside of our um, knowledge, notification, and control that are violating people's constitutional rights. That's the that's the framework. We can't just allow anyone to come into Chicago, play police in our streets, in our neighborhoods, when they don't know the first thing about our city. That's a recipe for disaster. And that's what you're seeing playing out in Portland on a nightly basis. We don't need that here. That is not a value add, and it doesn't help enhance our public safety. Now, what's actually happening out there? Here's uh, Department of Homeland Security Acting Secretary Chad Wolf on on some of the damage done to, to federal officers out there. That is not the case. We know what their aim is. Their aim is to destroy that courthouse and injure law enforcement officers. We have them on on video is saying that we know what their goal is and we're going to continue to protect and do our job. How how are your officers doing, your agents doing who uh, are are, have lost eyesight because of the lasers shown at their at their eyes? Well, I, I appreciate you mentioning that. We have two to three different officers. Uh, we are waiting on final results to see how much of their eyesight uh, will uh, permanently be lost uh, because of the activity of these criminals. As you indicated, they are shining lasers, uh, high powerful lasers uh, into officers' eyes as they emerge from the courthouse. So we're taking steps. We've taken steps to address that uh, and we'll continue to protect our officers at all costs. And again, all I need is the city of Portland to step up and do their job Uh, These individuals are on city streets. They're in city parks, arming themselves every night. And the city simply does nothing about it. Absolutely nothing. It's irresponsible and it's very dangerous. You know, I I am on record saying let Portland burn. Uh, 
but there is an obligation to protect the federal courthouse. And it's amazing. Uh, the mayor of, of Portland has all but told the police they're not allowed to help out. Um, that's going to come back and, and bite these people if they're not careful. It's already happening. It is Eric Erickson here. The phone number, if you want to be a part of the program, is 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. You can sometimes tell just how legitimate a big news story is by how much or how little focus the news outlets themselves give to the story. I, I would submit to you that if aliens were really visiting planet Earth, the media would be in overdrive on this. And yet they're not. With a story that suggests that uh, the United States and possibly other nations have uh, documentary evidence of off-world vehicles, that is alien craft, crashing onto our planet. Despite, this is from the New York Times, despite Pentagon statements that it disbanded a once covert program to investigate unidentified flying objects, the effort remains underway, renamed and tucked inside the Office of Naval Intelligence, where officials continue to study mystifying encounters between military pilots and unidentified aerial vehicles. Pentagon officials will not discuss the program, which is not classified, but deals with classified material. Yet it appears last month in a Senate committee report outlining spending on the nation's intelligence agencies for the coming year. The report said the program, the Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Task Force, was to standardize collection and reporting on sightings of unexplained aerial vehicles and was to report at least some of its findings to the public within 180 days after passage of the Intelligence Authorization Act. Now, uh, these are things that have been going on for a while. The New York Times in 2017 disclosed the existence of the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. Uh, it had $22 million in funding. It began in 2007 under the Defense Intelligence Agency. Uh, it was with inside the office, and it was because of the, um, it, the Navy in particular, Navy fighter pilots continuing to encounter very strange objects that seem to defy the laws of physics. The Pentagon program's previous director, Luis Elizondo, a former military intelligence official who resigned in October 2017 after 10 years with the program, confirmed that the new task force evolved from the Advanced Aerospace Program. It no longer has to hide in the shadows. It will have new transparency, he said. Mr. Elizondo is among a small group of former government officials and scientists with security clearances who, without presenting physical proof, say they are convinced... <coughs> <clears throat> they are convinced that objects of undetermined origin have crashed on Earth with materials retrieved for study. Mr. Reed, that is Harry Reed, the former senator from uh, Nevada, who pushed for funding the early program when he was in the majority, said he believed that crashes of objects of unknown origin may have occurred and that retrieved material should be studied. No crash artifacts have been publicly produced for independent verification. Some retrieved objects were later identified for military studies as man-made. Eric Davis, an astrophysicist who worked as a subcontractor and then a consultant for the Pentagon UFO program since 2007, said that in some cases, Examination of the materials had so far failed to determine their source and led him to conclude we couldn't make it ourselves. Mr. Davis, who now works for Aerospace Corporation, a defense contractor, said he gave a classified briefing to a defense department agency as recently as March about retrievals from, quote, off-world vehicles not made on this earth, end quote. If that was true, it's striking how little coverage the national press has given this. That suggests to me that perhaps there's not an extraterrestrial angle here. Even Marco Rubio, who is one of the people pushing for this uh, investigation, has said uh, that he was concerned about reports of these uh, encounters 
and that they need to find out who it is. He expressed concern it could be China or Russia or another adversary that's made some technological leap that allows them to conduct this sort of activity. He said the unidentified aerial vehicles over U.S. bases possibly exhibited technologies not in the American arsenal. And he said maybe there is a completely sort of boring explanation for it, but we need to find out. What if it's us? What if it's classified programs within the American military? But uh, have you seen the videos of some of these things? I, I You can't really explain. They've, they can't have people inside given the physics of what's going on here. Some of these things accelerate from zero to, to, to break the sound barrier in seconds. They can change course on a dime. I mean, it just uh, the human body couldn't withstand these conditions. Maybe, maybe there are new drone technology. Who knows? I have a hard time believing it's aliens. But by the way, if it is aliens, uh, the media is more obsessed with focusing on, on the political ramifications of the coronavirus than the fact that aliens are visiting the planet. You've actually got researchers who claim that some of the materials that they have that they have in their possession don't have earthly explanations. Some of them do, but some of them don't. You actually have a contractor who says he briefed the Pentagon on the existence of off-world material, off-world uh, vehicles. Now, let me get the exact quote. I don't. I, I want to be more accurate than what your average reporter might do. Let me get the quote from this guy, this Eric Davis guy. Off, yep, off-world vehicles not made on this earth. So, you want my crazy, my my crazy Eric analysis? <laughs> you know, we all have things that we know we probably shouldn't say in public. This is mine. It is, it's crazy to me that we live in a world that can believe that uh, we have off-world vehicles coming to Earth, and yet we don't believe that God exists. By the way, if you were an alien visiting the Earth and you came in 2020, wouldn't you turn around and go home and advise your alien neighbors, uh, nope, nope, stay away from that one. <laughs> Let me get theological with you for a moment. You know, in, in Scripture, Paul writes about um, our, our battles with the things unseen. That we know theologically. I mean, listen, if you believe aliens exist, it, you can believe that there's a heaven and a hell and a God and a devil. The things unseen. There is e Elisha who is with his helper and they're surrounded by soldiers and, and Elisha asks God to open the eyes of his servant who's afraid and, and he sees the angel army surrounding them. The things not seen made seen. I mean, Jesus is, is the thing not seen made seen the, the, the invisible made manifest to our eyes. I'm working with my kids through the gospel of John. We're, we're at this, this part of the end of, of chapter one and into chapter two, where, where, uh, Jesus makes seen the unseen things. C could, could, you know, if, if you believe aliens exist, why not a demon? Who knows? I mean, again, th these are the crazy things. Uh, and, and there's no reason I don't want I don't need y'all to call in and speculate on this. I'm, I'm just saying, you know, it, uh, we talked about last week that the are we in the end times? People, people all the time now are like, is is this the, is the apocalypse upon us? Is, are are we in the end times? Or are these the final days? You got random earthquakes. You got random volcanoes. You got plague. Now you've got alien vehicles, off-world vehicles landing on the earth. Something's going on out there, isn't it? It's very. It's all very odd. It's all very weird. The fact that that this is a news story, and it's and, and kudos to the New York Times, uh, the, the, their news division, not their editorial division, but kudos to the New York Times news division for pursuing this story over time since 2017, for obtaining the footage. If you've never seen this footage, it's actually worth seeing. Uh, the vehicles that they have encountered, these are Navy pilots who catch on uh, on their visuals and on their radar objects that uh, are oddly shaped, that can hover over the water, that have they have recorded them descending from like 80,000 feet down to the ocean and then skyrocketing back up at, at crazy speeds and no sonic boom. 
What are they? We've got no idea what they are. We don't know if they're ours. We don't know if they're some other countries. Are they from heaven or hell or, or an alien world? And if they're from an alien world, how did they get here? Because we know this people has, has some, some alien species has warp speed or, or wormholes or inner, inner dimensional space teleportation. Some such. I mean, the whole thing is crazy. I sound like Art Bell right now, don't I? <laughs> but seriously, this is, this is a story in the New York Times. And even the New York Times is not giving this coverage. You can tell how much credibility to put into a story uh, when the media organizations itself don't. And now you're saying, Erickson, but you're doing an entire segment on this. Yes, because I'm actually fascinated by it. And I'm actually fascinated by the people who their immediate presumption is alien technology. And what makes it so much more remarkable to me is the number of people who immediately will jump to alien technology who also say, oh, no, there, there, there's no such thing as God. So, you know, I, I, had a, I had a seminary professor one time who made a great point. And he said, you know, so something caused a Big Bang. At this point, everyone generally presumes the Big Bang was real. And so something caused the Big Bang. And in causing it, created the universe, which caused the creation of the solar system, which caused the creation of the sun and the planets and our planet and life on our planet and intelligent life. Had our planet been off its axis by just a degree or two, a few thousand miles this way or that in, in, in orbit around the sun different from where it is, if water didn't happen to be the, the one liquid that froze from top to bottom, a lot of liquids freeze from the bottom to the top. Water, actually, the ice floats. And, and none of these things happened. There wouldn't be life on this planet. All these little chances had to happen, which makes it actually very rare, very, very slim to none that we will ever encounter another species anywhere in, in the universe. I mean, the, our galaxy is is moving further apart from other galaxies. The, the universe continues to expand. Everything is flying apart. In a million years from now, our heavens will look different from they do now at night. The constellations will be changed because uh, it, space is flying apart. We will move more and more into a darkness. So at some point, whatever it was that caused all this begins to take on the properties of the divine the creator of the universe, what what caused the Big Bang. I know and you know if, if you believe in God, you you know uh, scientists can only speculate about what came before the Big Bang. You and I can know. But I, I increasingly, I actually realize I'm probably in the minority here. I don't really believe in, in alien species. I, I really don't. And to me, I can say that, and, and I don't think we'll ever meet them, and, and I don't think we'll ever meet them because it, given the speed of light and physics, I, I think it would be impossible to ever encounter them. So it doesn't really matter. It's all theoretical. But I believe in angels and demons and heaven and hell and the God and, and devil. And the, we, 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 if you want to consider that an alien species, we, we, we'll, meet, we'll meet God. But there's clearly something going on out there. And it is clearly unexplained. Now, I've talked to people who talk to the people who know about this stuff. And their prevailing theory is that there is a lot we don't know. But there is also a lot that we can speculate on and presume it actually is um, man-made. And we can actually presume that it is us and not the Chinese or the Russians that uh, the U.S. notoriously in the past has developed these sorts of projects, kept them very secret, including from Congress through budget appropriations, uh, including if you go back to the uh, the B-2 stealth bomber, reports of, of some sort of flying alien spaceship, of people having accidentally spotted it when they didn't think when they were out test flying it that people would see it, people saw it, wondering what it was. And the government denied it. The, the different branches of the military had no idea. There was no coordination. Clearly, it was there, and it was us. I don't think it's the Chinese 
or the Russians. It's worth finding out if it is. But I, I have a, a it's it's I, I presume more readily that it is an earth made uh, object of of materials that just your average run of the mill scientist isn't familiar with because it's experimental and classified. Uh, technological breakthroughs do happen in classified labs, but it's all still very fascinating. But what I actually find at this point even more fascinating is how little coverage the media is giving of its own reports that potentially, quote, off-world vehicles not made on this earth have been retrieved by the government. That's, That's the key takeaway from the New York Times story. And even the New York Times isn't giving a full-throated endorsement of that, which does make you wonder what else is going on. Hello there. The phone number is 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. Olivia de Havilland has died. Wow, that makes it awkward these days for the media, doesn't it? They're willing to talk about Gone with the Wind now. She was 104 years old, was she? 104, 106 years old. An impressive life uh, into her hundreds, into her three-digit lifespan, she was still riding a bike. She lived in, fell in love with France, lived there for 60 years. Uh, and uh, what an amazing uh, actress uh, from Gone with the Wind to, to Earl Flynn movies and the like. Um, living legend won two Oscars, and it's been very funny to watch the media, which decided that Gone with the Wind was bad. You know, when... Um, Oh, what was it? Uh, Warner Brothers rolled out their new service, their new video service. They decided to leave out Gone with the Wind because it was problematic. I I guess it was HBO Max. They left it out of HBO Max because they decided it was problematic. And now everybody's talking about it. And what a good movie it was. (gasps) You're not allowed to say that. But Olivia de Havilland uh, has has died. Uh, And, and. It's worth noting her life. You know, she was the woman who helped break up the uh, the movie studios back in the day. Uh, you used to sign contracts with uh, movie studios. If you were an actor, you could only work with MGM or you could only work with Warner or you could only work with uh, the, the various film companies. And it was called the studio system. And occasionally you could be given permission to go work in the film of another studio, but you were in yours. And if you took time off or they made you take time off, they continued your contract. And it was uh, in perpetuity, essentially. And so Olivia de Havilland sued uh, when there was a work stoppage in Hollywood and said that her contract was seven years. And by God, she she intended to hold them to the calendar year. And the studio said, no, no, when we postpone it, it, it stretches out. And she won. And when Jimmy Stewart came back from World War II, he uh, used her lawsuit to free himself from his contract as well, and thus ended the Hollywood system at the time, turning everything on its head. You know, Hollywood, as an aside, uh, while we're going through global pandemic, you know, they keep moving uh, the, the moving movies off, bumping the timeline and all. We're going to have to deal with this uh, China situation when it comes to Hollywood because, you know, I mean, just take, for example, uh, Top Gun. The Top Gun 2 is coming out. People want to see it, but they had to get rid of uh, different patches from Tom Cruise's jacket that were anti-China, pro-Taiwan. Because American movie studios depend on the Chinese box office for future success. And again, this goes to the media. I, I, y'all, I'm sorry. I, it drives some people crazy when I say this, but listen, uh, CNN is owned by Warner which owns Warner Brothers, which depends on the Chinese box office. MSNBC is owned by Comcast, which owns Universal Pictures, which depends on China for its box office. ABC News and ESPN are owned by Disney, which depends on China for its box office success. CBS Viacom owns Paramount, which depends on China for its box office success. In fact, the only free agent right now in all of this is Fox, because Fox sold off 20th Century Fox to Disney. It now just owns its its TV network, so it's not really beholden to China for its successes, because it doesn't have a box office. These others do. And so I do have to wonder, can they accurately cover China? before the Chinese decide that they've got to 
punish the film studios to get back at the news divisions that the parent companies own. Uh, this Look, it's a concern and nobody's talking about it. How much real coverage have you seen of late of the Hong Kong protesters because it's happening? Outside of Fox News, how much coverage have you seen of the Uyghurs in China being rounded up and th- sent to concentration camps? How much coverage from ESPN have they given to uh, the I- NBA dancing around the China issue? Even ESPN, when it was showing basketball games last year, remember the Hong Kong stuff, if someone held up a free Hong Kong poster, they immediately switched the camera to somewhere else. It's real hard when these companies are putting profit above truth. It is real hard for them to cover China. It's going to be a continuing problem unless we get a clue on on just how bad the situation is. Someone needs to stand up to them. Fox seems to be the only one. And, of course, the media maligns Fox. I wonder how many reporters out there are on China's payroll as well, because I guarantee you that's a thing, even though they all deny it. All right. I, I got to try something. I, I was setting it up during commercial break. And if you're watching the live stream, you, you saw me trying to set this up. I, I got to play. I, I got to play some video that it just happened on MSNBC. And if you're on the live stream, it's worth it, it's just it's worth seeing the video. So you get an idea of, of uh, you know, the people on the left and this sort of stuff. And I've been wanting to try this anyway. So I want to play this. I'm not going to guarantee it's going to work the way I want it to work. I'm, I'm trying it live. I should never do this. But you got to hear this. This is from MSNBC. Camp, a frontline gun violence prevention and intervention team working to de-escalate violent situations in communities across the country. I can't think of anyone I want to speak to more on this, Erica. When you look at these violent clashes from over the weekend, a person shot and killed during a protest in Austin, three wounded in Louisville, what do you think needs to be done to de-escalate this? I think the first and foremost is the removal of... Um Trump's personal SWAT team out of these cities. I think the resources into these communities so that the people like our organizations can go out and work with the people around reducing violence and reducing the things that folks need so that they can not in, even into engage in acts of violence. I think when we look around, if everything that you said was peaceful protest turned into, you know, and so if they just leave the folks alone and allow them to to protest, there will be no violence, right? It's, there's no reason for the police to engage with the individuals doing the protest. Just leave them alone and, and allow them to let their voices be raised. And arrest the officers of Breonna Taylor. Convict the officers of George Floyd. Uh, you're, you're allowing the whole city to erupt. By not arresting individuals, like it doesn't make sense. It doesn't balance out. Wait, 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 wait a second. Wait a second. You, you, they did arrest uh, the office, the George Floyd officer. Wait a second. There, there is an investigation into the Breonna Taylor situation now. Uh, just and um, her actual claim is that ah, yeah, y'all. This it, it just it, it hurts my head. I'm sorry. Her actual claim is that if if you just didn't arrest the protesters, they wouldn't be violent. Now, what comes first, uh, the chicken or the egg? What what comes first, uh, the arrest or the violence? What 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 comes first? Because that that's 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 the premise here. the The premise is that if you just left everyone alone, they would be peaceful. Now, the police left everyone alone. And they weren't peaceful. There were riots. And so they had to engage. And and in the the rioting, people got arrested. And it got more out of hand. And they had to bring in more enforcement. This, This makes no sense. This makes no sense. The, their, their willingness to do this, their, their, their claim that just leave them alone and they'll be peaceful. No, they were left alone originally. Remember in Atlanta? In Atlanta, they were left alone and they decided to vandalize CNN. They marched into Buckhead and started smashing windows. They did it in Chicago. They've done it in Portland. They've done it in Minneapolis. They've been burning down stuff. And you know, in particular, it is the black community that has been victimized. It is the black community that is suffering the most. And it is progressive activists who are committed to defeating Donald Trump 
that in and of themselves are doing their very best to burn these cities down and harm the black community, which is why they're, although it's they're they're in the minority, there are in fact a growing number of people in the black community thinking, you know what, these this party and these people really aren't in my best interests. Maybe, maybe I need to vote for Donald Trump. And then there is Burnell Trammell, a Black Lives Matter activist who also supported Donald Trump, who aggressively supported Donald Trump, who covered the windows of his business in Trump signs. And over the weekend, someone drove up to his business while he was out front and gunned him down and drove away. And there are no suspects. I think we need to leave these cities to their own devices. But man, it is not a good situation. And this could actually help the president come November. Wow. So so this just happened. Uh, it is Eric Erickson here. Welcome. Uh, th- so this, this, this just happened. Uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones uh, on her Twitter feed, actually, she just tweeted this out. I'm, I've am i always said the 1619 Project is not a history. It is a work of journalism. Not Notice she didn't say reporting. It is a work of journalism that explicitly seeks to challenge the national narrative and therefore the national memory. The project has always been as much about the present as it is the past. So at least they're beginning to admit that it is all BS. At least they're they're willing to admit that it's all BS. Uh wow. It is. It is a propaganda effort. It is a propaganda effort uh, by anti-American leftists who want to historically revise the history of the United States. But it's not a history. It's journalism. It's not reporting. It's your, what is your, it's like creative writing? Is that what this is? It's, it's creative writing is what the 1619 Project is? I mean, you know, again, I, I gotta, I gotta give this woman credit. She has been able to profit off the guilt of white liberals. And that's impressive. Uh, she has been able to, to profit off the guilt of a bunch of white liberals at the New York Times, uh, who, who they don't like the country to begin with. Remember, the New York Times, they were apologists for Stalin. They don't like the United States. They don't like the American ideal. Uh, they don't like um, the way we have charted our course as a country. And uh, so they, this, this woman was able to – it's much like, oh, uh, what's her name? Uh, Robin D'Angelo, the, the, uh, the white fragility woman who, who argues that uh, white people are fragile and they're racist from birth. I mean, Adolf Hitler had these views on Jews, and, and now she has them about white people. And the New York Times drove her book to the number one bestseller list. These people, they're profiting off the guilt of white liberals. It's like in academia. I mentioned this last week, and I don't want to be a broken record on this stuff. I, I realize. But I mentioned last week, uh, you know, when you go to college these days, even, even back when I was in college 20 years ago, uh, you, you got to take a diversity class in, in your freshman orientation. You take these diversity classes where it is inevitably a white woman who has figured out how to profit off the, the white progressives. You would know, you know, you know, colleges, I would take it more seriously if they weren't hiring white women to tell all the white kids uh, that they're all a bunch of racists. But but inevitably, that's what they do. That it did at Mercer when I went there. And then at Mercer, the Mercer Law School one was even more ridiculous than the one undergrad. Uh, it's just, it's so, and you know, there are a bunch of, uh, uh, the law professors tend to be very liberal and they're such true believers in this stuff. I mean, they really believe this stuff. It, it, it's it's absurd what they believe. Uh, they, they, they can't believe in a heaven and a hell, but by God, they believe in this diversity stuff. <laughs> so they get you in there. And really, I mean, every single person in there, even the black students who are in there are like, this, this is all a bunch of crap. <laughs> but you're forced to do it by the administration. 
And so you all sit there together, and that's actually where you build your bonding experience in college. And they all think, the college professors and, and the academics and, and the heads of, of law schools and whatnot, they really think that you're bonding over learning how, how you white students are, are all bad racist. And really, it's you're all in there realizing this is such a, a ridiculous experience. And so you bond together over how your law school uh, tuition money is being siphoned off to these hacks who come in and do this stupid diversity training stuff. You're all in there together whispering each other, is this person for real? I mean, it really is kind of funny. In fact, you know that you know the people who come out of this. At least back in my day, uh, when I was in college, you know that the 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 students who came out of the diversity thing with with everyone a university. It didn't matter whether you were Democrat or Republican. It didn't matter whether you were liberal or conservative. Everyone knew it was garbage going into it, and that it was just something you have to do. And the students who came out of there with everyone like having a worse view of them were the ones who were the true believers who thought it was was such a good idea. I mean, you go in there and and you just, essentially you keep your mouth shut. And if you're a white person, you know, you're supposed to fall on your sword and say how, how terrible white people are and that, you know, this, and, and I've just, you say something like my eyes have been opened. Thank you so much. I did not realize this was a problem. And of course the, the white liberal feels good that you use the phrase, my eyes have been open or the scales have fallen off. You co-op Paul for secular religion. And, oh my goodness, the, 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 the little white people who figured out how to shake down the college administrators, they're like, yes, I got another one. And meanwhile, the black kids are there like, uh, why are we paying a white person to, to talk about this stuff? <laughs> It's such a scam. I mean, it really is. It is one of the biggest ca- scams on college campuses. This, this Robert, Robin D'Angelo person, hang on a second. The Washington Free, I wasn't even going to go there, but now I might as well. The Washington Free Beacon, where is this? They've got a story on this woman and her shakedown of college campuses. Uh, here we go. The Wages of Woke. This is fantastic. Dr. Robin D'Angelo, the best-selling author of White Fragility, Claims to believe in accountability, D'Angelo used to list the racial justice organization she donates to as part of her extensive accountability statement, including a monthly land rent paid to the Native American tribe that used to occupy Seattle. (laughs) But when the Washington Free Beacon began contacting the organization she listed as recipients of her largesse, D'Angelo scrubbed the site, removing their names and the dates of her giving from the public domain. A version of the page remains available through the Internet Archive after briefly being unavailable due to what the site said were technical issues. The paper was edited again as recently as Friday when D'Angelo wrote she would begin donating 15 percent of her after tax income in cash and in kind donations starting next month, suggesting she had not previously, as the page exhorts, given a percentage of her income large enough that she could feel it. This about face is odd for a woman who's made her career demanding white people not respond defensively in hard conversations. D'Angelo vaulted to superstardom upon the 2018 publication of her book, White Fragility, which argues that all whites are racist and any rejection of that fact is only further evidence of it. To address racism, D'Angelo argues, requires the sort of anti-bias instruction she's selling. And colleges have paid through the nose for this gate. Uh, D'Angelo's clients, according to her website, range from Amazon and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to Unilever and the YMCA. D'Angelo reported charging up to $15,000 per session. A March 2019 appearance, for example, cost the University of Kentucky $12,000, as well as a $5 a minute phone call fee. Recent virtual events run up to $175 a ticket. The 8 to 10 private events D'Angelo says she speaks at each month likely net her at least $1.5 million annually. Her book, which made the New York Times bestseller list in its first week and currently occupies the number two slot, has only added to her suggest. Her publisher says it sold 1.6 million copies, 1 million this year alone. Given a conservative 8% of royalties, that would mean the book would make her over $2 million. This is hilarious. So this woman, a white woman, 
is going out telling white people that they're racist from birth, and if they deny it, that's further proof of their racism. It's like Hitler talking about the Jews. And yet she's been able to cash in on the diversity racket, overshadowing uh, black people who have uh, African-American studies degrees. I, I wonder what her degree is in college. Is it, it, what, I wonder, if does she have a women and gender studies degree? I don't know. My goodness, though, she's got three homes all bought before White Fragility was published. She's got a four-bedroom bungalow and half a duplex in Seattle. She's got a cabin in rural Washington, and and, uh, it looks like there's a Brooklyn brownstone as well. Good gracious. Oh, no, no, the brownstone is someone else's. This woman has cashed in on this stuff. Uh, and, and you know that this is what this is what good li- white liberals do. It, it is, uh, by the way, what what other progressives do as well. This Hannah Nicole Jones woman. They're cashing in on the guilt of white progressives, and you you know the strategy here. This this is important. The strategy is always to tell the white liberals exactly what they want to hear. So white people are bad. A white liberal can believe that. And as part of white guilty consciousness of the white liberal, the white liberal is willing to write checks to causes that these people want them to give to, including their own. But then the white liberal is told that really they're not the problem, that collectively white people are, but specifically it's those Trump voters who are the problem. <gasps> yes, we believe that. We believe it's it's the white Trump voter who's bad. It's not us. We voted for Barack Obama. We're not racist. Never mind that a significant portion of Trump's voters had voted for Barack Obama. They just, they want to believe whatever makes them sleep well at night, and they're throwing money at this stuff. College campuses do it. Law schools do it. And these people have made an entire career of it. This, by the way, you, you've got to, you know, I, I ridicule women and gender studies a lot uh, because it is a garbage degree for someone who's going to go stick their hand up the rectum of a puppet and do puppetry arts for the rest of their life and then complain about not making any money and paying off their law school loans. So that they, they get their degree in women and gender studies uh, where essentially it is grievance 101. Uh, I am woman. Hear me roar. Uh, and uh, they got to they got to find a way to make money. And so the way you make money if you've got one of these grievance degrees from a college campus is you either go teach or you become an activist. Or if you want the big bucks, you angle into feeding off of white guilt. And kudos to those who have broken into that market. You can get a job at the New York Times revising American history to suit your fabulous interests. You can get a job going around the country as a consultant on white guilt and white fragility. You can show up at at local colleges and universities and lecture all the students on how they're bad. And, and, uh, I mean, the thing is, I don't really know people other than white progressives who take this seriously. And even a lot of white progressives don't. They just feel like they have to do it. It's kind of a religious thing. You know, a lot of people don't want to get up on a Sunday morning and go to church, and they feel like they have to. God wants you to be in church. God actually says uh, you, you should get together with the body of Christ. People don't really want to get up early and go to church on a Sunday. That they want to find a podcast or they want to watch it on you, but you know there's something to the community aspect of it, and so you do it. Well, wh- white progressives they don't really want to shell out for this stuff, but it, it has become a secular religion, and so they got to shell out for a lot of this stuff as well. And it makes them feel good about themselves that they're spending money they don't want to spend on stuff they don't want to spend money on to learn how they're bad people, uh, because that absolves their guilt of the historic wrongs of Trump voters that they have to put up with. <laughs> I mean, the whole thing is a brilliant scam. I mean, and and just kudos to those who have found a way to pay for their grievance degree from a college campus uh, by becoming the grievance counselors who then make other people try to grieve over over their guilt, which doesn't actually work. It is it, it I again it, it was the funniest funniest moment of my law school career. It was there at the beginning. We were upstairs in, on the third floor of the law school at Mercer. We're sitting in this room. And you've got the, this white woman in there trying to convince us all we got to put labels on our backs and we've got to approach each other as, as we would presume that the worst of us would approach that person. And we've got to acknowledge then after we've done that, the aha gotcha moment is why did you think someone would approach that person like that? It must be, you must recognize it and you must deal with it and, and, Oh Lord, the number of people in there who are rolling their eyes and 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 just just all you got to do is you got to affirm these people and tell them that they're right, 
and you just skate by. And then you get out of there and no one's mind is open up and, and because it's all ridiculous. There's no reason. To, you know, you can open your mind to a point that your brain falls out, and that's what they actually want. And and the people whose brains actually do fall out are the ones that you don't take seriously the rest of your three years of law school. And again, this this was bipartisan. It was it was uh, a, a transcended ideologies, uh, left, right, center, Democrat, Republican. Everyone knew this was garbage, and we all had to get through it because that was part of going to law school. You got to do this garbage. Going to college now, you got to do this garbage. No one took it seriously except for like three or four people, and those were the three or four people that no one really paid attention to the rest of the three years in college or in law school because you knew they weren't serious people by taking that serious. In fact, you know, it's like the people who put their pronouns in their Twitter bio. I actually got an email the other day from a PR person who at the end of their signature line put uh, she, her. Those are the people you never take seriously. Those are the people not worth taking seriously. And the people who get their women and gender studies degrees and go off and do these grievance schools where they try to make people feel guilty about being white or what have you, those are the people you don't take seriously. But they're the ones who have figured out how to shake down the college and academic market by feeding off the the guilt of academics who are of the left. Hello, people. The phone number, if you want to be a part of the program, 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. There's some breaking news to deal with real quick. Uh, Robert O'Brien, the National Security Advisor, has tested positive for COVID-19. This comes on the heels of him um, <clears throat> being around his European counterparts. He's been traveling. Uh, he is the closest person to the president to have been diagnosed with COVID-19. Uh, they're tested daily for COVID-19. His office is around the corner from the White House. It's down the hall from Mike Pence. Uh, and it has just uh, showed up that um, he was positive. But he's been out of the office since late last week, according to people familiar with the situation. So he has it immediately been around the president in the last few days, which is uh, good. Also, Joe Biden has enlisted Chris Dodd uh, to aid the search for a female VP, which all but ensures Kamala Harris is not going to be the vice presidential pick. Reason being Kamala Harris actually prosecuted before she was a senator. She prosecuted in California a bunch of uh, Christopher Dodd's buddies. Uh, So, yeah, um, interesting. Now, Uh, The thing with Chris Dodd is the stories in Washington, D.C. are legendary about Chris Dodd and Ted Kennedy getting drunk around women and what they did. Putting Chris Dodd in charge of vetting women for vice president is like putting a frat house in charge of vetting strippers for a strip club. It is it's, it's crazy that they would do this, but they are. Um, so I, I know someone, I know someone who had an encounter back in the eighties with Chris Dodd and Ted Kennedy was at a party. She was a lobbyist. They were drunk and essentially they got on either side of her and forced her to go to the car with them and wedged her into the back of the seat, uh, cop and feels all over her headed to their house. And she knew what was going to happen. And, that by the time they got there with the driver, uh, they were passed out, and the driver told her to to climb into the front seat and get out of the vehicle from the front door, uh, and that they wouldn't remember it. And now, I, I've heard this from the person who says it happened to her, and I believe her. She's a credible person. Uh, and these are the types of stories that, that are out there. And they have floated around for a very long time about these people, about Chris Dodd, about uh, Ted Kennedy. And I would not be surprised if some of these stories start to circulate, and they probably should. Now, um, I want to go to the phones. To Jimmy and and Dawsonville, you're going to be up first today. Jimmy, welcome. Thank you. Sure. What's going on? I got a question. One of the uh, things I wondered about is all these riots and protesters. Who are they? Where they come from? What do they do for work? Why are they able to do this night after (laughs) night after night? Because they all live in their mom's basement. You know, I, I, I have encountered some of these people. And they're all like like young 20-somethings. In fact, I don't know if you've heard this. Uh, the NAACP in Portland, Oregon, 
is urging an end to the protest, saying that there's no purpose in them anymore, that it's just young white people who have taken over the protests and given them a bad name and distracted from George Floyd, the NAACP is pretty upset with it. It, it really is a bunch of, of idle white kids uh, from Hipsterville who are doing this because they got nothing better to do. I mean, you can't go out to bars and nightclubs anymore. They've all closed them back down. So you gotta you gotta go riot if you want to hang out with your buddies. You gotta go try to burn a courthouse down. That that's what's going on here. I mean, when the NAACP and I noticed this hasn't got a lot of press attention. I saw one headline about it over the weekend. It was one little news blip that the NAACP is is tired of the rioting, saying that these white kids have taken over. That has nothing to do with George Floyd, Ahmed Arbery, or the like. It's just white kids nursing vendettas against the president. And uh, they should uh, wind them down. And the NAACP is right on this. It really is. I, I have seen uh, young white hipsters headed off to the protests uh, and prepared to do violence. And they've got their knee pads on, their, their black uh, military gear. They've got motorcycle helmets. Uh, these are not kids headed off to a peaceful protest. It's kids who want some excitement in life, and they're not getting it in the basement smoking weed. Hello and welcome. It is Eric Erickson here, the Eric Erickson Show across Georgia, the nation, the world, even through that series of tubes known as the Internet. The phone number, if you want to be a part of the program, 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. Glad to have you with me today. Uh, Ted Cruz was on Face the Nation over the weekend Uh, talking about China, you know, the president continues to say China virus. The Democrats are now coming out saying it's racist. Never mind, they were calling it the Wuhan virus or the Chinese virus in January and February. They've never repented for their sins. They just figure they can attack the president now. I want to play you some of what Ted Cruz said. Care passionately about what happened in Houston with shuttering that consulate. What did you learn, and will more consulates be closed? Uh, Well, they may well be closed. That consulate was closed because it had been engaged in espionage. It had been engaged in intellectual property theft. They used it as a base for spying in Houston and throughout the Southwest. And for a long time, I I have made the case that China poses the greatest geopolitical threat to the United States for the next century. In fact, the last time I did this show was from Hong Kong in October. Yes. I traveled there. I met with the protesters. There were 2 million protesters in the street. And you'll recall, Margaret, I dressed in all black in solidarity with the protesters that were standing up to Beijing yeah. and communist China. And what one of the most, in fact, the most significant foreign policy consequence of this pandemic is people are understanding the threat China yeah. poses. And in particular, This virus originated because of communist China's deliberate cover-up. They arrested, they silenced the heroic Chinese whistleblowers that tried to stop this at the outset. And because of that, over 600,000 people are dead. Because the Chinese communist government lied. He's right. Ted Cruz is right. And it is interesting to me the number of people who want to just blame Donald Trump for this stuff. By the way, it is worth noting uh, how little you hear in the press these days about other countries. Remember all of the coverage about Italy? Italy put the whole country on restrictive lockdown. And then France did as well. Great Britain did. Everybody except Sweden. And have you noticed that We've kind of given up European coverage in the press. I I have a theory as to why that is, why we've given up global coverage. Is it, could it be perhaps because the virus is rebounding in those countries too? Italy is the one country where it seems like they've managed to flatline it and keep it flat in Europe. Uh, But France is seeing an uptick. In Spain, other countries are starting to restrict travel with Spain again because Spain locked down and now they've come out and and the virus is is escalating again, which also given the climate of Spain suggests that warm weather uh, isn't really stopping the virus, although there may be some evidence that the warm weather is weakening the virus uh, so that people who get it in the summer don't get as bad a case. Uh, there's not a whole lot of evidence out there that these European countries have done better than this country, even though they've done longer lockdowns, mandatory masks, and the like. There is evidence that the mandatory masks do work in, in the states around this country where mandatory masks are now actually enforced. That's the key here. Like California had mandatory masks, but no enforcement. In areas of the country where the mask mandates are now being enforced, you're starting to see within two weeks a 
decline in the virus. Interestingly enough, here in Georgia, the number of people wearing masks has gone up significantly to about 80% of Georgia's population now regularly wearing masks when they go in places. And the virus is plateauing, if not declining, here in Georgia. Uh, but there, you know there have been zero citations in Georgia for it. That That's kind of what one of the missing data points here is that the virus in Georgia is declining – even as the state is not enforcing a mask mandate, the the state is seeing more people wear masks and there hasn't been a single citation. So these cities that have imposed mandatory masks and said they were going to fine people haven't actually seen a single law enforcement official um, do anything with the virus. Now, I, I want to, I want to talk about the Georgia data real quick of where we stand with the virus. Um, in Georgia right now, uh, it, our rolling average is beginning to tilt down again. Uh, we went, you know, so the 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 fourteen day window ends on July thirteenth, and there were three thousand eight hundred fifteen cases. Uh, that comes uh, after July sixth, where you had those five thousand three hundred forty nine cases. And the trajectory, the, the rolling average trajectory is actually a pretty good setup now in Georgia. And we have plateaued at the very least, even if we may not be declining. But there is evidence now that there is a week-over-week decline. In fact, there is a 4.5 percentage point decline in uh, positive tests. Even though the testing rate is either going up or staying the same, the number of cases per week is going down. So it looks like Georgia is actually trending in the right direction. Florida, Arizona, Texas all now trending in the right direction where they've either stabilized or are in decline with their number of cases And that is good news that all of us should be happy about. And yet in the media, they're still willing to take blame. Now, Tom Frieden was on the the TV panels this weekend over what to do about uh, the virus and the spread of the virus and how do we combat the virus and can we open schools. This is uh, Barack Obama's head of the CDC. Doctor, let's start with schools because your old agency, the CDC, put out new guidance this week that that emphasized the importance of in-class education for students and also downplayed the risk uh, of young people, children in school, either getting or transmitting the virus. Is that the right message to be sending out to parents? Chris, it's really a question of leveling with people, being straight about what we know and what we don't know. One thing we know is that kids are way, way less likely to get seriously ill from COVID, about a thousand times less likely than older adults. And in addition, uh, the severity of COVID is fairly similar to the severity of a seasonal influenza for kids. But that's just one part of the equation. What about the staff? What about the teachers? What about people in the homes of kids, grandparents and others, who those kids could infect? So one thing the guideline says is, If the risk in the community is low, you may be able to operate the schools safely. Chris, the bottom line is any community can open schools. The hard part is opening them and keeping them open. And only a community that both controls COVID and opens schools carefully is going to be able to do that. Yep. You got to have a measured response. Now, here's an interesting thing from Reason Magazine. A survey... Uh, let me actually click into the article instead of just using the the tweet. Uh, a new survey is out about schools. More than 120,000 American schools closed since March, affecting 55 million students. Uh, there are a, a new survey by Ipsos Public Affairs found that private and charter schools were substantially more likely to continue providing students with meaningful education services during the lockdown than traditional public schools. The survey found that private and charter school teachers were more than twice as likely to meet with students daily than teachers at district-run schools. Private and charter schools were about 20% more likely to introduce new comment to their students during the lockdown. About one in four, every four traditional public schools simply provided review material for what students had already learned before the closures. Arlington Public Schools, for example, in Virginia decided in April not to teach students 
any new material for the rest of the school year. Another national survey, this one conducted by Common Sense Media, found similar results. Private school students were more than twice as likely to connect with their teachers every day and about 1.5 times as likely to attend online classes during the closure. A recent report by the Center for Reinventing Public Education found that only one in three school districts examined required teachers to deliver instruction during the lockdown and less than half of all districts expected teachers to take attendance or check in with students regularly. And just yesterday, the New York Times reported that in many towns, private schools are reopening while public schools are staying closed. You know what's going to happen in a couple of years in this country? We're going to have uh, even uh, even new grievances from the left. And this time, the grievance is that private school kids have an advantage. And it's the money is the advantage and we need to cancel private schools because those kids have an advantage and we got to level the playing field. Uh, Y'all, you know, the, the solution here is to make private school accessible to others. That's one of the, the genius plans of the Republicans is to allow school choice and allow parents uh, with kids uh, who can take a state subsidy to go to Private schools. And the left has opposed this. The teachers unions have opposed this. And yet it's the private schools and the homeschoolers who are getting better educations now. we got to come up with a plan to open these schools. And a lot of school districts are just failing at the job. Here's Brett Girard, Admiral Brett Girard, uh, the, the Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Services, on this issue. I just have two very – I'm being told I have to uh, <clears throat> end this interview because we have other guests. But I have two yes or no questions for you just because I think that will make it – I want to get your answers on it. When it comes to contact tracing and the state's not drawing down enough money that's there for them to do it, does the CDC need to improve its guidance to states as to how to do that, yes or no? No. I think the, the contact, okay, the contact the tracing guidance is pretty clear. But more, literally more important than contact tracing is to wear a mask, right? We have to assume that everyone who's on the street could be positive. And if you're positive and you wear Absolutely. a mask, you will not transmit it to others. Um, would have loved to talk to you about the hairdressers, both hot with COVID, 139 clients, both wore masks. Right. 139, Wearing masks, not, not nobody a, got COVID. Not a single transmission of COVID. Yeah. That's why this is much more important Absolutely. than anything we do. And last question, sir. Yes, sir. Um, should schools, no matter what, even if they have a positivity rate in that community of more than 5%, even if the virus is spreading in that community, should schools open in the fall? We have always been clear that the presumption needs to be that we want our kids in school for all the reasons you know, social, right. emotional But if the, um, positivity, if, if the positivity rate is high and, and the virus is spreading in that community, should it open, yes th- or no? There is, there is no one size that fits all. Obviously, if the virus is high okay. in that community and spreading, you have to temper your opening or do alternative strategies. I think that's been clear. One size does not fit all. I was in Massachusetts yesterday, 1.7% positivity, whole different idea than if you're in McAllen with a 25% positivity. You know, poor Jake Tapper there asking him these questions just once yesterday. These aren't really yes or no answers, and he had to do it because because the clock was running on that show. that They've got commercial breaks they have to hit. Um, I, I've got floating breaks here. Uh, like I go to break right now if I wanted to. I can wait another minute and go to break. I know how long those breaks are and, and those breaks are defined. Like this will be a three minute commercial timeout when I go to commercial. And, uh, they, they've got that there, but uh, in TV news, they try to hit hard breaks. Uh, every, every single break, they try to hit, hit, hit more breaks. About my hard breaks, a hard break is when you're forced to go. You've got no choice. So mine are at the top of the bottom of the hour. At, at 1130, I, I know I've got a, I've got a certain out time that I have to hit every time. And at the top of the hour at, at 58 and 50 seconds, I have to be done. Uh, I will get cut off, but the others I can float. Um, and Jake Tapper doesn't have that much luxury and, and those really weren't yes or no questions, but he tried, but good for Gerard for wanting to answer them. Uh, one last one on schools. You'll recognize this guy's voice. Today we're here to talk about, uh, opening up our schools. And the truth is to open up America again, we've got to open up America's schools. 
He's right, the vice president. Uh, you, you're going to have to figure out a way to open these schools. It is becoming a big deal. Uh, before we go to break, uh, speaking of breaks and floating breaks, this half hour is sponsored by First Liberty Building and Loan in Noonan, Georgia. A uh, local operation. They've been doing it since the early 90s. The Frost family there uh, wants to help your business grow. And if you need access to PPP or you need access to capital to grow your business, you should reach out to First Liberty Building and Loan in Noonan. Uh, they make their own lending decisions. They can help you. It is firstlibertyga.com is their website. Firstlibertyga.com. Uh, that's their website. And they want to help you. They want to help your business. Uh, and they can help you with PPP. They can help your business get access to, to large access, large capital amounts in order to grow your business. I highly recommend you reach out to the Frost family. They've been doing it since the early nineties. They know small and mid-sized businesses and they know how to help them become big businesses and they want to help you grow as well. Firstlibertyga.com is their website. And thank you very much to them for sponsoring this half hour of the show. Is the baseball season going to survive? Philip and I are texting back and forth during the break on this. It, it, it is amazing that uh, there are so many people out there right now who were excited by the return of baseball. Now half the Marlins team, uh, or, or, does anyone even watch the Marlins? <laughs> I'm so mean. Um, half the Marlins players were infected and, with COVID-19, so they're not going to be able to play and, now, rumors are spreading rapidly that they're going to uh, shut down the rest of the baseball season. I, there's got there's got to be a path forward uh, for sports, and of course, you know the uh, uh, the Yankees Phillies game is being postponed as well. That that is the headline after the Marlin COVID nineteen outbreak. The Yankees Phillies game is postponed because the Marlins played the Phillies over the weekend in Philadelphia. Uh, they are not going to play now the Monday night game as scheduled. They're going to wait and see uh, if the people at the Phillies were infected. And now you've got the the NFL pundits are out there saying, oh, shut down the NFL season. Uh, Kyle Brandt is out. Uh, there's a segment of the NFL media that seems to be almost rooting for COVID to affect the season. They want it. They see the Marlins news and say, yep, lots of luck football. These are people who make their livings off football. I don't get it. Uh, Ross Tucker, a uh, NFL analyst, says uh, it feels like it's highly coordinated with uh, correlated to people's general disposition. The negative pessimistic people focus on the concerns and issues. The optimistic people focus on solutions and answers. Um, it just it, it doesn't seem to want to end. Sports are giving people hope uh, to be able to get through this, and I just am not sure that uh, they're going to we're going to have a solution here. Meanwhile. The global warming, doom and gloom people are at it again. I'll re let you, read you this news blurb real quick. James Hansen, the director of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies and sometimes referred to as the father of global warming, has concluded partly on the basis of his latest modeling efforts and partly on the basis of his observations made by other scientists that the threat of global warming is far greater than he ever suspected. Carbon dioxide isn't just approaching dangerous levels. It's already there. Unless immediate action is taken, including the shutdown of all the world's coal plants within the next two decades, decades, the planet will be committed to change on a scale society won't be able to cope with. The particular problem has become an emergency, Hansen said. You know, here's something that's very interesting. The United States, when, when China shut down and basically all production in China stopped, the level of greenhouse gas emissions in the world plummeted measurably when the united states shut down it did not affect the world that much now why because the united states has been so good at already controlling its greenhouse gas emissions i mean going back to the bush administration the private sector in this country has made great strides in changing it is countries like India and China, the, the BRIC countries, they call them, B-R-I-C, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. They're the ones where the problem is. And the United States constantly gets the blame from the Western press because they're really – it's all about tearing down the United States, not actually fixing the problem. But I, I got to tell you, uh, when you're in a global pandemic – 
and the global warming scientists come out and say, you know what, we we gotta we gotta implement the Green New Deal. We gotta do something draconian, or else. Uh, I'm I'm sorry, but I have a hard time believing the problem. Never let a crisis go to waste, it seems, and I got a hard time actually believing the stuff. Um, and maybe, maybe, maybe there's a real issue, but here's, here's the thing. Um, I'm willing to believe that the world is warming, but I'm also willing to believe that, uh, the human role in it is overstated and that it is a natural phenomenon by and large, uh, that has happened throughout this planet's history. We know that the world has been hotter than it is now. We know that it's been cooler than it is now. Uh, it, it, what is remarkable to me is that we can go through these massive um, freezing periods on the planet with brutally cold winters and snow everywhere, and they say, oh, well, that's global warming. And then it gets hot. Well, that's global. Everything is global warming. It has become such a dogmatic religion, it's hard to take any of it seriously. And I don't blame people for tuning it out at all. Uh, these people have done a terrible job, and they've essentially turned it into an anti-American campaign when we're not even the problem, which suggests there's a lot of ideology at play here and not a lot of science at play here. So I'm not sure why any of us should really take any of it that seriously. Hello there. It is Eric Erickson here. The phone number, if you want to be a part of the program, 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. I want to talk about John MacArthur for a minute. I mentioned it on Friday. Um, I, I, John MacArthur's church in California. Now, let me let me back up here for those of you who don't know. Uh, John MacArthur is one of the most famous pastors in the country at this moment. Uh, he runs a, a, an organization called grace to you. He's a prolific writer. Uh, he is a, um, he's, he's got study Bibles. He is the pastor of grace community church. Uh, he oversees the master seminary, a master's university. Uh, he is a prolific minister. Highly respected in evangelical circles. Uh, he's got a study Bible. He's got commentaries on uh, the on the Bible, and he has decided he is going to defy the orders of the state of California and resume worship services. And I mentioned this a little bit on Friday when they released their letter. Let me read you a portion of it. Christ is Lord of all. He was the one. He is the one true head of the church. He is also King of Kings, sovereign over every earthly authority. Grace Community Church has always stood immovable on these biblical principles. As His people, we are subject to His will and commands as revealed in Scripture. Therefore, we cannot and will not acquiesce to a government-imposed moratorium on our weekly congregational worship or other regular corporate gatherings. Compliance would be disobedience with our Lord's clear commands. Some will think such a firm statement is inexorably in conflict with the command to be subject to governing authorities laid out in Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2. Scripture does mandate careful, conscientious obedience to all governing authorities, including kings, governors, employers, and their agents. In Peter's words, not only for, to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. In so far as government authorities do not attempt to assert ecclesiastical authority or issue orders that forbid our obedience to God's law, the authority is to be obeyed whether we agree with their rulings or not. In other words, Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2 still bind the conscience of Christians. We are to obey our civil authorities as powers that God himself has ordained. However, when civil government is invested with divine authority to rule the state, neither of those texts nor any others grants civic rulers jurisdiction over the church. God has established three institutions within human society, the family, the state, and the church. Each institution has a sphere of authority with jurisdictional limits that must be respected. A father's authority is limited to his own family. Church leader's authority is limited to church matters. And government is specifically tasked with the oversight and protection of civic peace and well-being within the boundaries of a nation or community. God has not granted civic rulers authority over the doctrine, practice, or polity of the church. The biblical framework limits the authority of each institution to its specific jurisdiction. 
The church does not have the right to meddle in the affairs of individual families and ignore parental authority. Parents do not have the authority to manage civil, civil matters without circumventing while circumventing government officials. And similarly, government officials have no right to interfere in the ecclesiastical ways matters in ways that undermine or disregard the God-given authority of pastors and elders. That that and their their letter goes on to state, and and one of the things they note is that the um the letter does not rely on, they do not hang their hat on the First Amendment. In fact, they specifically cite the First Amendment to note that they're not hiding behind the First Amendment. They they make no constitutional argument for their right to meet. They make a religious argument that they are uh, compelled to meet. Now, I, if I went to uh, Grace Community Church, John MacArthur's church, I would not go to the worship service. In fact, I saw the the picture from Sunday of them in the congregation, and you got a thousand people into that congregation, no one wearing a mask uh, with MacArthur, and that would give me the heebie-jeebies right now, particularly in California where the virus is spreading. But here's the thing that's worth noting. He is a pastor, is the shepherd of his flock, and he gets to make the decision for what he thinks is right for his church and what he thinks that his church needs, and he thinks his church needs to be meeting, not remotely, not via YouTube, but in person. And there's this phenomenon that has started now, largely in social media, but beyond, and it's it's gone on uh, since time immemorial, but it's it's more amplified now where you've got other pastors who have rushed out to write op-eds on why John MacArthur is wrong. Or, well, if I were John MacArthur, here's how I would do it. I'm not going to stand in judgment of of a pastor shepherding his flock, and neither should you. I think the bigger outrage is what John Roberts and the liberals did on the Supreme Court. You know, so in Nevada, your casinos can be open and they limit crowd size in the casinos based on the the square footage of the casinos. But with churches, they're not doing it based on crowd size. They're they're capping the number like 50 people in a church, regardless of how big the church is. So you can have a church that's in an airplane hangar and it can only have 50 people. But if you had a casino in that same airplane hangar, you could have a thousand people. And a church in Nevada uh, sued. It went to the Supreme Court. John Roberts sided with the liberals on the Supreme Court. It was John Gorsuch, uh, who is it? Gors- Neil Gorsuch, Neil Gorsuch, who wrote the dissent that nowhere in the Constitution does it give the government the right to side with Caesar's palace over Calvary Chapel. It was a fantastically short dissent, uh, five to four decision. And Roberts, of course, just not wanting to rock the boat. But he got it wrong, badly wrong. And there are there are criticisms to be had. And, you know, frankly, there are criticisms to be had of churches that are doing this. And, and God forbid if someone went into John MacArthur's church and had the virus and spread it and people start dropping like flies, uh, it's going to ruin his ministry. It's going to undermine his credibility. And, and you, can, you can know that the devil is going to try. But it, it really is unseemly to me that we – now, listen, I'm a pundit, and my job is to tell you what I think. And, and, you know, I get hell all the time from people for telling you what I think and say, well, you should just say that – if you're critical of the president, tell it to me privately. Don't don't tell on the radio. People listen to you. Well, that's the point. I, I would never say to you guys publicly something I wouldn't say privately. But that's my job. My job is, is with you. It's to tell you what I think. And to the extent it is my job to tell others what I think, I will tell others what I think. But I, I'm here with you guys, and I'm going to tell you what I think. And, but I just I find it unseemly that these other pastors are rushing out to pin op eds to criticize John MacArthur for what he's doing that he thinks is the best for his church. My church is meeting outside on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. In fact, we got an email over the weekend where the church is encouraging people if you're going to show up for the outdoor service to please wear masks. When you're congregating outside, because people are people are getting uh, used to doing it, and so now they're starting to congregate and interact with each other, and not really socially distancing. And the church is like, no, no we still got to socially distance. Wear a mask if you're going to be up close with other people when you're coming and leaving. If you're congregating in fellowship before or after the service, please be respectful, of everyone. Wear a mask, but we're still going to meet outside. We're still going to spread out. Uh, we think this is the best way to be able to sing and do what we want to do and contain the virus. I love the approach. I don't like getting up at. 7.30 in the morning to go to church on Sunday at 9, but I like the approach. 
and we just because th- there are crowds and they're not necessarily socially distancing. Um, we've actually not been attending regularly, and I wish we were, but we're just we're not given our family circumstances. I've been walking my kids through the Book of John. We, we're going to do more of that tonight. They don't know it yet, but we are. Um, and it, but what works for one church may not work for another church. And, and I, I got to tell you, one of the things I think that's happening here too is particularly among the Southern Baptists. I grew up Southern Baptist. I'm in the PCA right now, but I got a lot of friends in the Southern Baptist Church. Um, a lot of ministerial and evangelical ties within the the Southern Baptist Convention. And there are a number of different groups within the SBC and within Protestantism, evangelicalism out there. You've got uh, Nine Marks. You've got the Acts 24 group. You've got the Grace to You group. That's MacArthur's group. You've got the Gospel Coalition, uh, Reformanda, and a number of others out there. And some of these are uh, church funded. A lot of them are donor backed and they're squabbling between them as they compete for attention and donors. And one group saying to their group, I would do it a different way. And, and uh, you, you've got the squabbling over what MacArthur did between these groups. Some of them, not all of them. And, and they're all great group, groups led by great people. I support them all. They're all good. I, I find all their work valuable. But the squabbling has a lot to do with donors and eyeballs. And, and frankly, MacArthur in the last couple of years has kind of he, – he's aligned himself to a degree as someone – who has affiliations with uh, those who would support the president, but he's not all in like some people. He's not like a Robert Jeffries or, or a Jerry Falwell Jr., uh, but clearly conservative. Uh, he's taken on Beth Moore. I, I think he did a bad job with that. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, and, and so now they're all squabbling. With it, and it's just unseemly to see pastors getting that political online, uh, fighting with each, over the, uh, with each other. The bottom line is, you know, you all know how I feel. Avoid crowds and wear a mask. But I'm not going to condemn someone who thinks, hey, you know what, in, in, my, in my church, we need to do something different. You, you know your church better than I know your church. You do it. Where I will criticize people is the Dr. Fauci incident. Y'all, some, there are days I think the conservative movement needs a, a, a burning fire to burn through and clear up the conservative movement. I, I I got a problem with this one, and, and some of you are going to disagree with me, and I want to be very diplomatic in how I approach this. Anthony Fauci threw out the first pitch at the Washington Nationals game last week, and the outrage should be over his pitch. It was horrible, and it was kind of silly that he wore a mask up on the field, uh, up on the mound, but you know and I know if he didn't wear a mask on the mound, he was going to get criticized by people for not wearing the mask on the mound. And he wore the mask on the mound, and there's no way the man can win. He was criticized for that. People thought it was ridiculous, and, and in his mind, he's trying to show people it can be done. But Fauci got to sit in the stands with his wife and best friend, and pictures have circulated of Fauci without his mask on. Now, I know and you know and we all know that that uh, pictures are snapshots of time. And you can take a mask of someone with a ridiculous facial expression. What I actually had is it was a half second. They were about to sneeze or something, and someone took that picture, and that picture defines them. With Fauci, uh, there were two pictures taken of him with his mask down. And I see members of the conservative movement not just criticizing him, but some of them even trying to fundraise off of this as an outrage that Fauci's telling everyone to wear a mask and here he is not wearing a mask. Well, even Fauci has said that if you're taking a drink of water or something, pull your mask down and then put it back up. And that's what he was doing. One of the pictures you don't see the water bottle. And so now there are these water bottle truthers out there. So, oh, he didn't really have a water bottle. But if you look at the subsequent picture, he actually had a water bottle. He was drinking water. And you're allowed to do that. Even Fauci has said that. And I just, I have a hard time taking seriously the conservative outlets that are outraged over Anthony Fauci pulling his mask down to drink water. He's with his wife and his best friend. He was tested the day before and tested negative for COVID-19. So even if he was, even if he had COVID-19 that day, he wouldn't have been contagious because it takes several days for you to become contagious once you've contracted the virus. He had tested negative immediately the day before. Now, I realize there are people out there who say, well, it's hypocritical, and yes, okay. You can say that if you want, but seriously, is this your big issue of the day, undermining Dr. Fauci? I- I'm amazed at the intellectual energy being spent on trying to undermine a man who is advising the president on a regular basis because he may be telling you what you don't want to hear, and he's an expert and you're not. 
I just I, I, I when did the conservative movement become all about grievance and whining? This is not fear. He told us to wear a mask, and he's 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 not socially distancing. And he's not, who who the hell cares? Honestly. If it's to point out hypocrisy, okay, but you are kind of distorting what actually went on. He was being consistent to his and the CDC guidelines. But I just I, I'm I'm at a loss of the emotional energy being spent over this by people on the right. I just I I don't I I don't understand my own side. Some and am I even a part of that side anymore? I'm a conservative, but it seems like you know I, I'm one of those conservatives who silly me thought that you know. Uh, limited government was a good thing and, and not going bankrupt as a nation was a good thing and, and uh, we should be left to uh, let the states alone and let the states do most things. And now I'm surrounded by people who just, just spend as much money as you can and, and the debt doesn't matter anymore. And I still think it does. And, and I, I think that the level of whining about Fauci is, is ridiculous. Who cares? And yet that's what we want to be. You know, the left are the ones who are always grievance mongering and whining about the, the slightest thing. And yet it seems like there are some people on the right who intuitively have decided that um, that, that we've got to whine just like the left. I, I don't want to be a part of a nation of whiners. I don't want to be a part of an intellectual movement that's turned into a movement of grifters and whiners who are just trying to fundraise off of petty grievance. I actually would like to be part of a movement that is about ideas that make this country better. And to the extent the conservative movement has abandoned that, I, I guess I got to uh, go find me new groups to be a part of who actually think ideas matter and the left is bad. And the way to combat the left is not to not to embrace the left's agenda, but to actually outmaneuver them on the stage with better arguments and persuade people, not yell at people, but persuade them that our ideas are better. And you know what? I think remarkably most Americans still recognize limited government uh, that is not as powerful is actually a better thing than what the left wants. And we can win without being hysterical whiners. Wow. So Chris Cuomo uh, can't believe, says he, he wonders if we can trust the data from Florida's governor. Uh, this is a man who covered for his own brother's botched job in New York. Unreal. Uh, let's see. Um, I want to go to Chris calling. Uh, Chris, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me on, Eric. Um, I wanted to share with you something that I, I saw at a lunch meeting I was at today at a local restaurant. Um, they had ESPN on, and it was that first take show with Stephen A. Smith, and he had Roland Martin as his guest. Roland Martin was pushing the uh, voter suppression narrative in um, on this sports talk show. He was talking uh... about, yeah, yeah, he was talking about how he specifically mentioned North Carolina and said that, that Republicans were specifically targeting black people in North Carolina. Yeah, you know, okay. I, so, you know, I know Roland. Uh, we, we've actually we, we've taken road trips through South Carolina together, and he and I disagree on this right. issue. Uh, and, and whether or not he and I agree on the issue, having ESPN do this, this is why their ratings went down so much. And I realize they got right, nothing right. else to talk about. But remember that they got rid of Jamel Hill from Sports Center largely because she was cratering the ratings, uh, turning everything yep. political. And th- there's just there's no escape on this stuff. And, and look, I. I like Roland and I disagree on everything. Uh, we, we have clashing personalities, but I, I would say, I mean, I would, if the man needed anything, I would give it to him. I have seen him uh, have people throw luggage at him while we were standing outside a hotel before thinking because he was in a suit, he must be yeah. the valet at the hotel. But I, I just, come on, can we not get an escape from them? It's like the, the WNBA teams walking off the basketball court the other day. Now, I, mm-hmm. I got to tell you, Chris, first of all, thanks for the phone call, but I don't know a single name for any of the WNBA teams. I don't know that anyone even watches the WNBA. And for people who are trying to give them a chance because they wanted to engage in a sporting activity, walking off the floor the other night when the national anthem was played, and by the way, some of them, they they walked off before they even started the song. They knew it was coming and walked off. I'm I'm not going to watch something like that. I find it all disrespectful. Sorry, y'all. I still think it's disrespectful to take a knee to the national anthem. Another thing Roland and I would disagree on. Um, I, I think it is thoroughly disrespectful to take a knee to the American flag. I, I, during the national anthem, I, I think it is flat out disrespectful, and I think it is ridiculous of ESPN to go all in on p- 
politicizing sports and talking politics. People have always historically turned to sports to escape politics. And to have rolling on ESPN talking about voter suppression uh, in North Carolina and the like, what does that have to do with sports? I, I'm that the, I just can can we not find other things to talk about, folks? Can, can we not find things that uh, where, where we can actually engage with each other civilly and civically? Everything's got to be turned into politics these days. I just, and you know, by the way, I, I have a theory. If you look at the charts now, I know why the virus is spreading. If you look at the data at this point, it is abundantly obvious that the viral spike we saw beginning in the middle of June uh, and, and continuing until now, it had nothing to do with governors of states reopening the states. Remember all the people say, where's the, the blood on Brian Kemp's hands? or on Ron DeSantis' hands, the, the virus didn't spread. They were all said, give it three weeks, give it three weeks, we'll see the spike, and the spike never came. There's a spike happening now, and I, I know exactly what caused it. It wasn't the governors reopening the states. It was the American people watching a media that criticized protesters in April who wanted to go back to work, giving hagiographic, worshipful coverage to the Black Lives Matters protesters who were in the streets, not socially distanced, and most of them not wearing masks. And who cares about the virus? These protests need to happen. And the American people saw that and just said, F it. You know what I mean when I say that. Not going to say that word on radio, but you know what I mean. It was the American people saying that. To heck with this. If you're going to attack those protesters and praise these protesters, you're not playing it straight and we can't believe you anymore, and we're just going to get back out there. If you're okay with them being out there, you got to be okay with us out there, and people just went off and did their own thing because the media played a role in that, and they'll never acknowledge it or admit it. And that's why the virus has spread. That That's why the virus has started to spread. The American people can no longer believe the media to paint a truthful story, and they had to take matters, take their lives and livelihood into their own hands to figure out what was going on, and some of them got careless along the way, but you can't believe the press to play this stuff straight anymore. you got to do it yourself.